I want to officially start our meeting. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for joining us, all of you, friends. And Ernest, I'm really happy to reconnect with you. I mean, it's been a long time, really. Um, I mean, from school, I remember, you know, you were always an enigma to me. You know, you were this mysterious, I don't know, you were this cool cat <laughs> at school. Just don't count the years today. I, I don't. I don't want to count. You know the years that we have known each other. We don't need to. <laughs> but I um, how old we are. But, uh, there are yeah. questions uh, I am very curious about. You know, I, I've I've known you, but then I haven't really known you. You know, so uh, I want to know where you grew up. Where did you actually grow up and, and start music? This is this is going to be a very long story. Um. So anyway, hi guys. Uh, it's good, to, good to see all of you. Uh, thank you, Milana, for uh, having me on your series. Uh, my name is Ernest. Um, I I am. Oh, where do I start? Um, my my right dad. Is English. My my mom is Chinese, and uh, my dad grew up in in, in UK, middle of nowhere, near Leeds actually, but still middle of nowhere. And um, I started playing piano, I guess. Well, none of my families, none of my parents or any of my families that I uh, know of are, are musicians or artists, but my parents, they love music. I mean, even to this day. And uh, we would listen to music like 25 hours a day, literally. <laughs> and uh, that, was the, that was the environment that I grew up in. And uh, I started piano when I was about five and a half years old. And uh, I, I got a gift of a little toy piano with a little booklet, you know, that tells you which, which note to press. It was a toy piano, it wasn't a real piano. So it was, you know, that. And uh, I, I got so interested in that. I, I ended up waking everybody up every morning. I started playing at like, I don't know, six or seven o'clock in the morning, waking everybody up. So my mom say, all right, why do I start you, you know, with a, with a couple of piano lessons and and that's that's how he started and uh my dad my dad is a chemist in in a old sense of the word you know bomb and that sort of thing you know <laughs> and uh, and he worked for and he worked for various chemical companies union carbide at one point and um his his last appointment was with dupont in delaware in any case, we, we moved around quite a bit, you know, my, my childhood days. I, we never stayed in the same city or in, even in the same country for, for more than a couple of years. So we moved around quite a bit. We lived all over, you know, U.S. or obviously, you know, for a long time in the U.S., uh, in Asia, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, you know, back in the U.K. as well. And um, my Julia actually was my first school, Milana. I, I was I was actually in Manhattan School of Music uh, for a semester. And then I transferred to Juilliard. Mm -hmm. And um and then I you know I studied with uh with with a very well known teacher, Jacob Latina, who was a Beethoven expert, Beethoven specialist. And uh, I, I had a fantastic time with him. He passed away uh, some years ago. And uh, it was in Julia where I met uh, Milana. I mean, we, we were, don't count the years, but it was, you know, some time ago. <laughs> and it was the last century. Actually. 1996. <laughs> <laughs> that was the last century. And uh, there was, was Julia back in the 20th century. And uh, it, was, it was a very tight, neat group of people. But then it was before the time of Facebook. It was even before the time of emails, before the time of cell phones. Uh, I think I was the first student at Julia to use a cell phone. I think I was. Probably. <laughs> and, but, you know, imagine that, you know, think back 25 years, 30 years. And, you know, human connection was, was very much a physical connection back then. You know, it wasn't an electronic connection. You know, there was, there was no emailing, no Facebook, no nothing. You know, it was either we spent time speaking to each other or we don't spend time speaking to each other, you know. So, uh, so we did spend time, you know, say hi and and you know we we share a couple of classes together. But then, you know, you, you, 
there was no Facebook. I couldn't check where you're from. You could, you couldn't see where I was from. You know, you didn't see my friends. I didn't see your friends. So Milano, we we never ended up, you know, at a bar, you know, mm-hmm. talking about or sharing our life stories or anything, you know. But you know, we got to see, we actually saw each other every day, you know, day in and day out at Juilliard, you know. Anyway, um, many years at school. After that, I stayed on in New York for, for a little bit. I played a little bit. I taught a little bit. And then... Uh, well, I, I felt... have a question. I want to interrupt you. During Juilliard years, I remember you were... You had something going on outside of school. I remember that. And what was that that was happening? <laughs> God, something. Oh, God. You know, New York wasn't an easy city to live in. And um, I, I don't come from a very well-off family, so I, I had to, I had to work, sort of, you know, to to support myself and to get through those uh, Julia years. So there was more than something. It was there were many things going on. Yeah, well, I <laughs> work, work everywhere. You know, I, I, you know, try. You know, I tried really hard to 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 survive you know but i had i had a good time i mean it was you know we, we were barely 20 years old you know you know early 20s you know we what do we know what do we know you know we it, it was it was fun for me whatever it was you know and there were, there were so many things going on but i remember and, you were quite inter like you were entrepreneurial right you know we were like studying at home and and you were like i, I think making a I living think, <laughs> I, th- I think I had to on some levels, and I think, or or rather, we put it another way. If we put it another way, it was because um I think I I absorbed the the New York spirit really well when you know all those years that was you know we were in New York. Um, I remember you do you still remember Milano? Every year, uh, our president Joseph Polisi would host a fundraising concert on the a uh, fundraising dinner. On the plaza, and he would invite all the suits, you know, in New York to come, and they all dressed up, and and they're really nice. And then, you know, we 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 were right in the middle of New York City in, in Manhattan, midtown Manhattan, and we got to meet all sorts of people. And I think that sort of rubbed off on me. And I wouldn't say I was an entrepreneurial, but I I think I was exposed. I was well exposed. To all different kinds of people, and and at that age, you know, it was impressionable age, and so I I had to find ways to, to to think for myself and and you know, took advice from this person and and from that person as well. Um, I don't know. It was so long ago, Milano. Why are you bring all these up? God. <laughs> well, it, it was always in my mind, so I, I figured, you know, now is the time to ask. You know. <laughs> okay. Well, tell me something. One second. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but during your Juilliard years, right? What stands out in your memory? Like, you, you know, it's just a highlight of the experience at Juilliard. I think my well, definitely lessons with my teacher Jacob Latina. You know, every lesson. You actually have a lineage, right? Like you, you, you've traced down the lineage of where it goes. Yes, through. yes. Well, I'll I'll talk more about that later. But you know, the the very experience of those lessons themselves. I mean, they were they were amazing. I mean, I I was I was seventeen, eighteen, and there he was. He was you know when I first met him, he was in his late sixties, and then you know he got on to his seventies, and you know he was fifty years older than I was. I you know, at that time, and uh, he's so much more knowledgeable. I can tell you a very funny story. Uh, even back at Julia, I don't know if you all knew, uh, we, we had only one lesson a week for an hour, which is no different from any other amateur pianist, you know, trying to learn piano from, from, from a teacher outside of a conservatory uh, setting. So even at Julia, we had only one lesson with our one teacher for one hour and so that one hour was extremely precious to me and so i would i was never late for my lesson i I was i was always on time i was never a minute late for my lesson and then there was one lesson i have a funny story to tell there was one one lesson where i walked in you know usual greetings you know hey how are you salatina how are you you know 
and da da da. And then you know, have you had lunch? Yes. What did you have? And then I I think I say something like I had Chinese food for lunch, and oh god, that blew up into a twenty minute discussion on rice. <laughs> Difference between Chinese rice and Italian risotto, and the difference between risotto from Northern Italy and risotto in Southern Italy, and that went on for twenty minutes. I hated that lesson because it wasted. I waste. He wasted twenty minutes. Twenty minutes of your time. You know, if you understand how precious these sixty minutes were, and I hated it. But years and years and years later, I st- I still remember the story. Years and years and years later, I realized my teacher wasn't just a pianist. He was a guy who knew how to live life. And come to think of it, I wished I had more conversations with him about Italian food, or food in general, or life in general. And I wish I had more time speaking with him. About things outside the piano, right. and so that went from hating that twenty minutes discussion on risotto, to now missing everything that my teacher said, and I had to I had to go back and do a search in my in my mental in my memory, trying to remember, you know, what whiskey was he drinking, which tailor did he use, did he mention which fountain pen he used. You know, I, anyway, so that that really you know stood out in my jewelry years, and and I really miss that. What else? Uh, I think um, the mixture of people. Uh, there was there was quite amazing. Again, this was before the time of Facebook and and electronics. You no, know? now when you go out on the streets, I, it's the same in New York or Florida, it's Hong Kong, Hong Kong, China. We we don't really look at the streets. We look. And our phones, we still look at our cell phones. We see in a bus, we see it on on a train. Every minute that we have that we're not doing things, we look at our phones. We check our phones. Back then, it was it was real connections, and I think back in the nineties, even though Milano, you and I never really sat down and share life stories. But I thought there was there was a very good mix, a very good melange of characters in our class and at Julia as well, because it wasn't just a music school. There were drama students, there were there were singers, there were uh, there were actors, there were, there were dancers, and then we had we had jazz players as well. Towards you know the end of our I'll stay at Julia, that stood out as well. I mean we had we had a good band of 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 bandits, you know. <laughs> and I, I I had fun mixing around with everybody. Uh, half of half of those I I don't really remember names right now, but uh, we we had fun. There are so many stories. Some I can tell, some I can't tell uh, on camera right now. But uh, uh, and it wasn't when I say a mix of good characters, I don't mean just students. I'm talking about faculties as well. Mm-hmm. For example, David Dubal was quite a character. He came here last uh, winter. He gave a lecture, and <laughs> he made quite an impression. <laughs> there you are. There you are. Uh, and and so many. I mean, Lorenzo was was, was quite character as well. And uh, you know, our, our present policy was one. Jane Gottlieb, the librarian. Oh God, nothing gets past her. You know, I mean, she knows every book in the library. I mean, how is that even possible? You know. Well, speaking of um, the library, you know, you yeah. have now a very unique library in Hong Kong. So, where, how did that passion start, and where it, where the idea came from? That we have to go back to to what I did after Julia. So, what I did after, after Julia was, you know, the standard. You know, what we all did. You know, we we played a little, we traveled a little, we taught a little. But then we we were still very much carrying the baggage that we had, you know, from school. You know, what we learned, you know, the repertoire that we had. I'm sure you you know you you must have done the same as well. You know, you, you know, took some of the things that you you learned at school out you know, and to you know to the concert hall on the concert stage, and you you might have learned some new repertoire. Uh, meanwhile, and I I did too. And then I realized one thing. The funniest thing was you know I was playing around, and I realized sometimes 
the audience would know more about music than I do. They would come up to me after the concert and they would ask questions that I cannot answer. They would ask, have you heard this recording by this person? I say, hmm, no. Uh, do you know that, you know, other than that sonata, Beethoven sonata, he also played that other sonata? No. And that sort of opened up my mind to a whole new uh, musical universe that the, the conservatory that we grew up in wasn't, wasn't the summation of, of all that is to music and that there's this whole other world, a more realistic, more, more humane musical uh, world that exists out there that, that people do actually get touched by, by all sorts of music. I mean, you, you may think that the Wallstein Sonata is the greatest sonata, whereas the audience say, eh, meh. And he would, you know, he would prefer a, a, a Mesna or a Rachmaninoff or something else that you've never heard of. And then I started straying away from what I've learned at school. And one composer at a time, one composer at a time, I, I went further and further away from Mozart and Beethoven and Chopin and Liszt and, and, and Schumann. And I got further and further away until now, I, I mean, I'm, I'm totally into, I wouldn't say obscure, but the composers who are less known or less performed on stage, uh, or I would, uh, I love calling them forgotten composers, composers who are, who are forgotten by history, forgotten by audiences, for, forgotten by, by musicians even. And I like digging them up, digging, digging them works out, out of, out, out of the, out of obscurity and studying them and, and researching on them and then, you know, presenting them to, to audiences and, and students. And this is this is how it all started, you know. And I started collecting scores, sheet music that are really hard to find. Uh, digging through old bookstores and antiquarian bookstores and and finding one copy at a time until my collection just gone too big. And now I have a modest collection of I don't know like three thousand scores over here about a thousand lps and i'm not counting beethoven sonatas in them in, in the collection uh so these are things that um that that had existed in that 300 years of our piano history that are forgotten by our history textbooks and um and this is not even all of it. I mean, I, I only specialize in a few areas. I realized that, and, and you know, the years went on, and I realized that I, I, I don't, for example, I don't feel for British music. I don't know why. I, I like Russian music. I yeah, like I see French, you all the time. Spanish, <laughs> Spanish, I love Latin American music. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't feel so strongly about Viennese, Austrian, German music, for example. I love American composers, um, Canadian composers. And then I love Latin American composers, Mexicans, Brazilians, Venezuelans. I love these composers, I love these music, you know. So my, my collection right now consists mostly of Russian, French, Spanish, and Latin American, rarely performed, rarely played, or even unpublished music. Mm -hmm. And the scores, yeah. because I, I noticed that you're looking for like first uh, editions, you're, you're really digging up some interesting scores. Well, most of these, most of these music uh, have only been printed once anyway. And then, you know, and, and that's it. You know, that's the reason why most people don't know about them because they were only printed, they were only published once. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if, you're collect, if you find a copy most likely that's the only printing that was the only edition that was printed, you know. And um, what happened in 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 those uh, early years when I started collecting these was I started playing them as well. So it wasn't just a it wasn't just a collection, you know. I started playing them, and I realized that the audience loved them because these are fresh sounding uh, repertoire. I mean, Beethoven is great, Chopin is great, undeniably great. But then you have heard 
all of those before. You have heard Chopin before. You know, Bach, I mean, it's literally, you know, toilet music. I mean, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to a, a hotel lobby, you hear Bach, you know. But when you start playing music, they are less performed to the audience. Those are fresh sounds. Those are those sounds really fresh. Those are fresh emotions, fresh sentiments, uh, uh, fresh feelings that you don't find in a Beethoven or Chopin sonatas. Oh, a and question. The, Sorry, I want to interrupt your thought. You just mentioned something about hotel music. So, do you think is is not a great idea? to play classical music as a background in a hotel or, you know, in a store? I don't have an opinion about that because, because why not? And why yes, I don't think it matters because if it's background music, it is background music. If you, you can argue that, you know, uh, the music sets the mood, fine. Um, but then no one really listen to it anyway i mean it is it is background music i mean no one's going to stand there and and analyze the first theme of a uh, whatever you know claire de lune that they're, they're listening to oh that's great paddling you know you, you don't do so that. maybe it dilutes the value then of the composition but then, but then we don't I, I don't i don't think so though milan I, I don't think the value of a beethoven sonata depends upon where it is played I mean, if it is a Beethoven sonata, it is a Beethoven sonata wherever it is played, you know? Yeah, Whether but for example, you know, just, you know, uh, recently I, I had an experience where uh, Moonlight was in the background and I couldn't help myself but tune in to the music and tune away from the conversation because naturally, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more drawn to listening to the music that I love, right? Even though I, I love conversations as well. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but then, but then, when when we're drawn to it, background music, background noise, we we're not we're not judging it. Though. I mean, we're just drawn towards it, and so it doesn't really matter whether they're playing a Moonlight Sonata or I don't know what's the latest pop group right now. I don't know, uh, uh, Guns N' Roses. You know, I, it doesn't, it, I, I don't. I'm sorry, I'm not well versed, <laughs> but it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you can say you're drawn to it, but then. If you're drawn to it, it's, it's merely drawing your attention to it, but it, you're not really judging the music. You're not really, you know, raising questions about how it, it is formed. So you're not really drawn to the performance of it. You're really drawn to, 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 to the music itself. So I, I don't know, I, I, Milana, I mean, on, on, on that particular question, I, I don't really have an opinion about it. I, I would say, why not? Or, or why yes, it doesn't matter. Okay, so I have um, another question though. Um, sorry, I'm interrupting you, but I actually have many questions. You know, discussion. We'll have a very passionate discussion today. <laughs> so, um, a question about you know you're you're performing all the unfamiliar works, right? And very often I get um, you know s people, for example, who are not very familiar with classical music. They want to attend concerts where the music is familiar, something that yeah. they know, right? Yes, so yeah. how do you deal with that dilemma, right? Because you are playing all unfamiliar works. This works in many levels. Um, I, I've been doing this for about a decade now, a decade and a half now. So um, not everyone can do that, I, I would say. Yeah, the, it really depends upon the artist because the art because the artist has to have a certain repute as well. So, for example, I have had actually uh, agents from 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 places who told me that you know, Ernest, if you come to our place and play the you know a uh, Beethoven sonata, we will not book you. So, if you're coming, we're expecting to hear something new. So, I would say that it is not just a program. It, itself but the artist as well so let's say obviously if i were to come over to florida uh, no one knows me yet in florida so uh, i would have to play something uh but if i were to go to florida frequently enough and you get to know me well enough i can confidently program something that will that will totally amaze you 
in a way that you 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 it would be an unexpected experience entirely. It would not be a Beethoven or or, or Chopin, and yet it would still be an enjoyable experience. This is one. Uh, two, I think it depends on the presentation. So if I were to start a recital right now, a new person, a new pianist, and I'll come on, on on stage, and the first work I start is a totally, absolutely unknown work, and it goes on for 45 minutes. This would not work. Uh, I think some smart programming is needed here. Or, in my case, I love to speak to the audience at the recital. I would explain what I'm about to play. I'll tell them a little bit about the, the, the composer, the work. Uh, I, I love making fun of things, myself or the composer, or even about the music. Um, just, to, just to sort of ease our attention into a new work. Not that I'm trying to reduce it into, into a, a simplified uh, a description, but then I, I think everybody needs a little help sometimes. I mean, even, even the artist himself, when I am approached you know, with a new work, I have to look up the background of the composer. I might even have to speak to the composer if he's alive. And I, I think the presentation is quite important here. And I don't think that I don't think that the old way of presenting a recital is applicable when you're presenting new works, if that makes any sense. Uh, so if you're presenting new works, it shouldn't be presented in the old ways. It should be presented in a newer way as well. So it you should, I mean, I, I've seen different ways of presenting a, a recital, a, a recital of new works. I, I'm usually, I, I'll speak. I usually, I'll just stand up uh, you know, you know, in the front of the stage, grab a microphone, or, or I'll just shout on top of my voice, and I, I'll, I'll just explain what I'm about to play, and and then I, I definitely not program a 45 minute sonata to start a recital, you know, I program something lighter, shorter to start, and yeah, I think how I much think... your conversation with the composer who is alive, uh, for example, from your previous experience. How much your interpretation has changed after speaking to a composer? Is there a change? I, 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 I have a constant lack of self confidence, and so I, I, I'm, I'm usually very insecure about my own play. But I, I would always consult the composer if he's alive, and I would always listen to. I would always try to find out the the back story. Of a piece of music instead of the, the the technicality of the composition itself. So I would not ask a composer, for example, you know, so what happened in the first theme, and 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 how did you modulate to that key, or or how did you come up with with, with the structure, or the form of this, or how how was this orchestrated? I'll, I'll usually not speak to a composer um, in that regard, but I'll, I'll usually try to find out the backstory, like, you know, so what happened during those years when you composed that, and I'm not sure if, if it helps, but it deepens my understanding of, of a work, and it adds additional colors to it, and from my experiences, I find that composers are actually very tolerating people. I mean, they, they seldom no, I'm serious, especially especially more composers. I mean, they seldom have only one conception of the work. I have had seriously negative feedbacks on YouTube on a piece of music by the mass audience and a fantastic comment from the composer himself about my playing. <laughs> If that means anything. But I wonder if, if that would be the same for, let's say, if Beethoven, right? So you've studied with, oh. with Beethoven scholar. Jacob Latana was a Beethoven scholar. So when he was ta t talking about Beethoven's music and interpretation and so forth, what did you get out of, like, if you had to say two words, you know, what would those two words be from your lessons about Beethoven's music? In order, 
authenticity, creativity. So you cannot start being creative. You have to start being authentic. Then you start being creative. So in in general, our work, you know, on a Beethoven Sonata or Concerto, we always started off with with very vigorous score reading. So it has to be very authentic. Why is that dot over there? Why is that slow over there? That has got nothing to do with you guys as listeners. I mean, you, it won't help anything at all. But then as, as a pianist, I mean, that authenticity is, is very important. And after you have dug out every meaning, if there's such a thing, to the, the slurs and the dots, we can be creative uh, with the music and, and do our own thing. And that's when it, that's when it, it touches you guys, you know, as listeners, because uh, that's that's what makes every performance a different performance, a different experience. Because if everyone were to, were to stick to authenticity, uh, every performance would, would have sounded the same. So uh, we thought time is always authenticity and then creativity. I guess I, I carry that into the work that I do today as well with, with living composers, you know, that's, that's the reason why uh, I always like to, you know, seek out um, living composers and, and, and talk to them. So I would like to know, you know, at what point in their lives, you know, they had written this and, and what happened then. And after that, I'll, I'll start doing something creative. I might even go, you know, uh, an opposite direction. And as I say, I, I usually find that composers are very tolerating. They're very understanding with, uh, with, with artists. And I, I think I really enjoy uh, surprising my audiences with new sounds and, and, and fresh experiences. Uh, and I think uh, this applies to, to me, merely me, uh, that I, I love giving my audience something. I love giving my audience an updated version of classical music. If that makes any sense, so uh, I think our general concept of classical music has always been music of the classical period, and everything grew out of the classical period. Okay, you can say Rachmaninoff is classical music, but then immediately when you think of Rachmaninoff, you think of Rachmaninoff growing out of Chopin and Chopin growing out of growing out of uh, Beethoven, you know, S something to that effect. So when our, our, our general conception of classical music is basically music from the classical period and everything that grew out of it. And I would always like to present an updated version of classical music, as in music that are written, you know, during our lifetimes. It doesn't have to be living composers, but at least, you know, composers that, composers who somehow, somewhere shared the same experiences then, you know, as we did. Uh, could be experiences in the 70s or 80s or the 90s or, or experiences now. And I find that, I find that these updated versions of classical music uh, speak even more directly to audiences than, let's say, a Scalati Sonata. You know, a Scalati Sonata is beautiful as a thing of beauty that is a little detached, that is very beautiful. But when you play something recent, you know, that is written within the last 50 or, or, or 60 years, I think the audiences usually feel closer to that piece of work as well. And especially if you start explaining to them, oh, the composer lived in New York, I mean, lived on Grand Street, he was a chain smoker. I mean, you immediately you connect with that, you know. Uh, if I were to tell you, you know, Beethoven, you know, was a the German famished composer who lived in Bonn. I, mean, I don't know how many of you have been to Bonn and, and then he, he went to Vienna, he lived in I don't know, 30 different apartments and, and it, it, Chopin had a, I mean, you know, obviously you know Chopin, but you can't really connect with him, you know? I mean, he was from, from a totally different time and place. So I, I find that playing updated version of classical music usually speak more directly to, to audiences. And I enjoy that experience as an artist. So I enjoy being an artist that's not really, you know, aloof and, and far and distant. I, I enjoy being an artist that is that is close to my Up audience. close and personal. So yeah. I, I want to touch on two more topics. 
pianos and um, suits. <laughs> and you're passionate about both. <laughs> I, I know that. <laughs> so first, pianos. Uh, are you interested in the mechanism of the piano? Are you interested what it is that attracts you to certain brands, let's say? Um, and what is it that you're looking for in the piano? There's a little part of history that you, you don't know about me yet, Milana. Uh, is that um, one, of the, one of the jobs that I had when I was trying to make a living was fixing the piano. Oh my God. I didn't yeah, know. so uh, I, can, I can actually, I mean, I'm, I'm an expert per se, but I can actually fix up a piano. You know, I, I can tune a piano, obviously, I, tuning is, is, is it's not difficult, but I can actually voice and regulate, I, 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 can, I, can, I can fix up a piano, you know. Great. And I, I love doing that. I, 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 I draw a huge uh, amount of satisfaction through, through the whole uh, process, you know, manual process of, of messing around with the mechanics of, of the piano. Are you, are you self-taught or have you no, been an apprentice? No, I've people. I've actually worked at piano factories before, even. And uh, restoration. Oh, yeah. In in the US or in, in, in... The US, in Europe, also in Asia as well, in Japan as well. And and um, so, but mostly in restoration, not in manufacturing of new pianos. So in restorations. Yet. Yet. <laughs> and, uh, Knowing you, I... we will have a new brand coming out in two years. <laughs> you never know. You never know. You never know. And then I'll be thinking you. <laughs> and then, um, and then I, I, I do have my preference uh, for you know certain certain brands. And obviously, you know now nowadays, I mean the, the piano market is 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 so you can say that it's very narrow and at the same time very diverse. Very narrow because. You only have it's sort of like a pyramid. You only have that few brands sitting on top of a pyramid, and then you have a host of, of others. You know, I, I don't want to use a bottom, but below the, the top brands. Right. And but at the same time, it's also, it's also very diverse because um, every every piano manufacturers and and every brand try to use a different rhetoric or different ways to 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 sell their instruments. You know. And they are not always what they are. You know, they're they all trying to sort of give you, give consumers an impression. For example, what really is the difference between a Mercedes Benz and a BMW? It's I don't serious. know. <laughs> I mean, but it's, it's the image of it. I mean, it's the image. I mean, this is all an image, you know. You think, you know, certain people would drive a BMW and certain kind of people, would, certain type of people would drive a Mercedes. But this is all, you know, an, an, an impression. I think piano brands do that as well. And so if we strip away all of that, we, if we strip away, if we were to strip away that, that, that whole pyramid brands and, and, and prizes, and then we strip away all those impressions and we really go into the piano factories, we really understand the brand, people who work in that brand. And then you, I think you start to see some very interesting things. You start to see that the reality of, of the whole music business and, and instrument making. And, and you start connecting with the instrument on a whole new different level. So this is no longer a product. You know, this is, you know the person, you know where it's coming from, and you know why it is made a certain way. So if you're now driving a BMW or Mercedes-Benz, it's, it's no longer just a German car. You know the guy, the mechanic who, who designed this particular model. I don't know if you can say it with cars, I mean, I'm, I'm not a good driver, but, but you know, I'm just trying trying to draw a parallel here. Mm -hmm. So you know, you know the, the the guy who designed this model and why he wanted to do that. So why he wanted that to be that, what that to be that needs to be here and that to be that. Uh, so it's the same way, you know. So how I rate the piano isn't necessarily a sort of a, a mathematical uh, a formula or equation. Or oh, this sounds better, or that that. Rather. It, it is a way of, of me understanding how the piano brand work 
hearts to 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 sort of achieve what they want to achieve. But what's the, in the heart of the brand, right? So, for example, so taking taking that 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 uh, case to car again. I mean, it's it's not really BMW or Mercedes Benz. It's it's knowing that oh, Mercedes Benz wanted to do that and they've achieved it, and so I prefer this. Mm-hmm. And what is it that you're looking in the sound of the instrument? What draws so, you to the instrument? Therefore, therefore, in the past ten years or so, so I, I've I've actually come in very close contact with the the piano industry. Uh, I attend the music uh, the music master every year in Frankfurt and and in in Shanghai. I've been there I don't know fifteen years now every year. So I'm I'm actually very close as a pianist. You know, I'm very close to the, to the piano manufacturers. Uh, from from uh, Steinway to Fazioli to Bossendover to to Petrov, I know the families very well. I know the Petrov family very well, for example, and 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 uh, Steingraber, I, I know the family very well as well. Uh, and then I started to I started to to know what they want to achieve in a piano. And if we are in sync, in that sort of ideal, I. I would stop preferring their instrument. So, for example, take for example, since Milano, you know the Fazioli piano very well. Uh, I know the Fazioli piano very well for over a decade. I know I know uh, Mr. Fazioli and, and his son, and, and I know what he wants to do with a piano. I, I really know what he wants to do with a piano, and I think he achieves it, and he achieves it beautifully. And and he achieves a hundred percent of what he wants to achieve, and that's the amazing thing. I mean, he sacrifices nothing to to achieve what he wants to achieve, and that's the beauty of the Fazioli piano. Beethoven achieved what he wants to achieve in a sonata, and that's the beauty of that artwork. I don't know if you understand what I want to do, so. That's that's the beauty of that instrument, and I think that's the value of that instrument. When that maker will sacrifice nothing to achieve what he wants to achieve, and he achieves it. Well, it's a commitment to the highest uh, quality that you can imagine, right? And and, so and I'm, I'm not trying to match any other brands, but let's say if I were to start a brand right now, the Ernest So Piano. And of course, everybody was was start out by saying, you know, you can. I'm, I'm sure a lot of your business owners as well. I mean, a lot of you start out by saying, I want to create the best product, but then that's that's the that's the dream, that's the garage dream that you have. You want to create the best product, but the moment you step out of the garage into the real world, you realize that there's there's a market uh, uh, equation to this. Because if you want to create the best product, you need to put in that sort of investment, that sort of time. And that sort of energy, and it's just not practical. So at the end, you compromise. You have done the best that you can to achieve, you know, the best that you can. So that becomes a product. Now, with a piano such as, let's say, Fazioli, he really sacrificed. He 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 makes sacrifices to to get to what he really wants to achieve. And ultimately, that instrument is a beautiful instrument, and I think that there, there aren't many of those instruments. So, I mean, we're not talking about the pyramid system anymore. We're just talking about the the real, uh, the vision, and 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 the sacrifices that you know the the, the manufacturer puts uh, behind his product. I mean, there are not many uh, such uh, piano manufacturers anymore, and the few that that. Had you know Sicilian doing that? I mean, those are beautiful instruments, and it's not just one brand. I mean, there's, there's several, several, not many, but there's several. I mean, they, they, they span on expenses. I mean, they would really, you know, it would really take years to produce a piano. You know, Ernest. Yeah. Before I, I, because I want to also uh, our friends to have uh, questions, you know, and, and ask you questions. Uh, and by the way, sorry if you hear background noise. We have a construction in the building, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Suits. Your love for for beautiful suits, and and what it is it? Well, you've I, always I, worn these gorgeous suits. You know, I want to know where you get them, where you make them. <laughs> Do you make them yourself? <laughs> 
I don't know. Gosh, this is this is a huge topic, uh, and it gets really geeky as well. Uh, this is <laughs> I don't know. Um, I th I think I I I I have a weirdly proportioned body, and I and I I started. You know, we have to wear. I mean, the guys, dudes have got no choice. We've got to wear a suit on on stage. I mean, women can be very creative with what they wear on stage. And I'm not naming names here, but you know who I'm talking about. But you know, stop laughing. But you know, guys, I mean, we've got no choice. I mean, we've got to put on a suit and a shirt and and sh you know the same pair of shoes, you know. And I realized that I I've had so many accidents on stage, coming out of of you know wardrobe malfunctions, and so I I realized that I realized that you have to really invest. In something of quality, so that you feel totally comfortable on stage. So that was the beginning of it, and then it started with a good shirt. Really started with a good shirt, and then you know from one item to, to the next. Now I I've I hardly go shopping. I I I have tailors and and things that are that are made for me, but they last years and years and years so i end up making less and less purchases and you see me wearing the same thing over and over again i mean i i don't really mind i don't really care but i mean i, I feel good in them playing in in, in my jackets and, and and shirts and you know uh shoes and um i think i think that's the most i mean i, I feel really good in them um I don't know. Latina had a really good tailor in, in London as well. Uh, the funniest thing is um, my teacher Jacob Latina from Juilliard. Um, he used he used to use a shoemaker called John Lobb in, in London. And when we were at school in, in the 90s, he was wearing a pair of shoes that was made 40 years ago. And every time I went to London, he would help me bring back a pair of shoelaces for them for, for him. And because he kept telling me that the shoelaces will break before the shoes will. <laughs> so I think he must have had, I don't know, a dozen pair of shoelaces that I brought for him and still in the same pair of shoes though. Anyway, I mean, that's, that's, that's really the whole thing. But then later on, I, I, I got into the really geeky aspect of tailoring, you know, like, you know, how you want your shoulders to, to be made, how many, how much padding there, there is in the shoulder and, you know, how wide did that, that shirt collar should be cut because I've got a wide fat face so the collar shouldn't be too, too thin and that, you know, so that's the geeky aspect of, of tailoring. And I, I enjoy that as well. And in conclusion to this, Milano, my favorite period in history is the 1920s and 30s and 40s, when men, gentlemen, would still dress up for every occasion. And and chivalry was still the main thing of, of the day, of, of every every gentleman, uh, well-mannered. And part of being a well-mannered person or a civilized person, cultural person, is to, is to wear of uh, uh, good fitting clothes, not just fitting the body, physically fitting, but fitting for the time of day, fitting for the season as well. So I, I, I really admire that. And, and, and that's, I mean, if I were to, you know, have a, you know, the time machine, I'll, I'll go back to 1920s right away and, and, you know, pay a visit to the Duke of Windsor and, and <laughs> <laughs> well, you're an artist in, in more than one ways. It's absolutely clear uh, to me and, and probably our audience members. I do want to open up um, if you guys have any questions uh, on your end. Um, please feel free to ask uh, questions. Greg, go ahead. Hi, Here. guys. How are you? Um, thanks for being at the uh, top of the uh, best dressed pianist list. You don't have what I would call the typical career of a of a pianist, and that is, uh, you're in very you're involved in various philanthropic ideas. So Milana's talked about the the uh, library. Um, was there a plan from the start to do all that? How did those things all come about, and what was your motivation for all those activities that you do? 
thanks, uh, Greg, uh, for for this because it takes me back to my parents as well. Um, that's a very good question. It's, it's the thing is, the thing is, I I never I never plan ahead. I, I'm not a I'm not the kind of guy who who have a ten year plan in mind, and. Uh, I, I was I was born in the seventies, and my generation, I think, I think that there were there were enough ups and downs that I've seen to know that, to know that uh, plans don't always work out, and adaptability is a key word here. And what that's number one. Number two is that my parents never planned anything for me. My dad, my mom, since they were, they were, they were not musicians, they, they never planned anything for me. So even at a very young age, now that you're asking me this question, I, I, you know, I, I think back to, to my younger days. My parents would, would let me run wild with my ideas of what I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And that, that sort of established my, my character as well. And I don't really have a plan. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing in two years' time. All I, want, all I know now is that I want to put every ounce of energy into what I want to do now. And what I'm doing now is, is that collection part, that, that, that uh, digging out forgotten composers, presenting them, teaching them, uh, recording them, and I want to go to places that I've never been and to share music with, with, with you know, uh, people. And that's sort of, I've, I've been to some very, you know, off the beaten track places, you know. I've, I've, played at, you know, I've played in Kazakhstan, of all places. I've played in some rural villages no one had heard of in, in, in China, in the middle of nowhere in China. Uh, I've, I've done all that and I love doing that. And... Um, I, I think I, 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 I had I juggled a very sensitive balance between work and and passion, and to do that is to never have a plan. I don't know, I don't know if that makes any sense because if you have a plan, you sort of have to put a lot of things away, even when opportunities come. And I, I don't really have a long term plan, and I would I would adapt to whatever comes my way. This, what we're experiencing right now, COVID-19, no one had expected this. And my last trip was back in January, at the end of January. I was in Spain, I finished Spain. And then I was, I came to Hong Kong and then the whole thing broke out and I couldn't go anywhere. Uh, that did not worry me though. Even though, if if I had a plan, I would I would fall flat on my face. But uh, I didn't really have a plan. So concerts definitely, but I I was not disappointed. So immediately I adapted, and I designed online courses for 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 various people, various groups of people, and it worked out really well. Uh, I I adopted new technology and and new ways of presenting myself to the public, and and that worked really well. And so that that's, I would say, part of my character, in that I I adapt and I adapt very quickly. And I would I would change direction very very quickly. So if tomorrow a new thing were to break up, touch knock on wood, you know, if a new thing were to break up, I would I would immediately adapt uh, to 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 a new path, right away, without thinking twice. Must be the Juilliard class that we were in because <laughs> we seem to be doing uh, very similar things, you know, react quickly and, and move forward. <laughs> Anybody else? Judy, go ahead. Ernst, you give me hope because I've always worried about the future of classical music and what I call butts in the seat. And I think updated classical music is what it is going to take to bring new audiences to classical music. Because you cannot just have gray hairs in the audience as they die out. 
And in some respects, I know this is in for Naples, Florida, a horrible thing to say. I think the the love of Beethoven over the last year has done some harm because people who have subscriptions don't want to hear the same thing all the time. Well, I'm sorry about that, but I have been concerts where people say, I'm so sick of Beethoven. So, Ernst, thank you very much. And I, I would love it if you would come to North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I would, uh, in a heartbeat. I let me, Judy. Uh, really thank you so listen, much. I do agree with you. It depends on the programming. You have to sometimes sandwich things in. You have to explain things. But once you get the audience involved, they love it. Thank, thank you so much, Judy. I, I just want to, I just want to, I explain myself a bit in that regard because I. It, you know, it's it's not just it's not just pure commerce with me. You know, with, with what I do. You know, I I just think that uh, human emotions have such a wide and unexpected range that not not even a Beethoven sonata, not even thirty two sonatas of Beethoven, could encompass the range of human emotions. So I would I would forever regard. The thirty-two sonatas as the greatest works ever written, but I do not regard them as the only greatest works ever written. And newer works or even older works, they all present a different facet of of humanity, of of emotion, of sentiments. And I think I think you and I, living in today's or 21st century, experiencing what we are experiencing, uh, we we actually we do require new works for us to go through that catharsis process, cathartic process, and not just forever turning back to a moonlight sonata for comfort. I mean, it is very comforting to hear a moonlight sonata. But to go through what we're going through right now, 2020, the first half of 2020, uh, to, 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 to express that or to take comfort in what we're going through right now, I, I just don't think that the 32 sonatas expresses all of what we're experiencing right now. I don't know if that makes any sense uh, to, to you all, but I just think that, I, I mean, t from 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 getting to know my audiences from a little bit of my, my traveling experiences from meeting uh, different walks of life. I just think that, I mean, humanity as a whole, I mean, it's, it's just a huge palette that is, that is in, inexpressible by a single body of artwork. So there you are. So this is my philosophy of, of planning of, uh, a program or presenting a recital. Anybody else has any uh, comments or yes, Marilyn, go ahead. Uh, Marilyn. You have to you have to unmute yourself, Marilyn. So make, yeah, make sure you unmute. Okay, okay. Um, can you tell us specifically about at least one new composer that I guess we wouldn't know something? Sp specific about him and the music that he has written and that you enjoy? Oh God, this could go on for another week. Uh, well, <laughs> so, uh, well tell, why don't, Marilyn, tell me, tell me a composer that you like then I'll, and I'll go along that direction and give you a new name. Tell me someone uh, that you uh, like. A modern, you mean someone like Rimsky? No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Chopin, Rachmaninoff, oh, or someone more than, you know, Mary Kondi. It doesn't matter. For listenability, but I, I'm a, a, an intermediate pianist, but I love playing everything. Uh, I love Bach. I love, uh, I, I love Beethoven. I love Schumann. I Brahms. So... But I, I do tend to the romantic, see? So new works are a little hard for me to take. I would, I would now, now that you mentioned Schumann uh, and Chopin, can I, can I recommend a new name for all of you today? 
uh, I love French music. I love French music. But a lot of French music, say, you know, works by uh, uh, Debussy or Ravel, especially late Debussy Ravel, they, they're, not, they're not easily accessible. I mean, the Impressionist sound is, is great, the first two minutes of it. But if you were to see through 20 minutes of it, I, it, would be, it would be quite a torture. Uh, but not all French composers write the same way. Uh, I would like to recommend a composer called, there you are, Severa. I don't even see the name. Uh huh. Yes. Yoda. Yes. Yoda mm -hmm. Severa. He was, he was, he lived in the same time as Debussy and Ravel. I'll hold it up. He lived in the mm -hmm. same time as Debussy and Ravel, except that he hated Paris. So let me put it, let me, let me rewind. Uh, when we, when we talk about Debussy and Ravel, we're essentially not talking about French music. We're talking about Parisian music. We're talking about Parisian composers. France, not as big as the United States, of course, still has a variety in, in, in his regions. And Severech was from the south. And not Provence south, but Catalonia south, so near the Spanish border. So he actually spoke Catalan yeah, and French. And so his music is a bridge of Spanish and French music. So he doesn't write in the Impressionist style. So he's still very melodious, but he has that tinge of, of Frenchness in him that is instantly recognizable. That, that beautiful visage of, of, of southern, southwestern France immediately uh, visible in his music. So I would highly recommend his piano works. Okay. There you are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he's written sets and sets and sets of works. And Debussy actually described his music as music with a with a fantastic bouquet of of bouquet, you know. Uh, I don't know how to say that in English even. Uh, you know, smells like you're, you're you're in the south of France, basically. What Debussy yeah. was saying. So I I would highly recommend you to look into uh, Savarac's music. It's it's not hard to find. It's on Apple. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Spotify. Uh, on and YouTube, occasionally, occasionally on the concert stage, I play a lot of his music. I recorded a lot of his music, and and I highly recommend that. It's just beautiful. Okay, thank you. Sure. Well, uh, Ernest, I mean, we can stay probably for another two hours and chat because there's so much to talk about. Um, but um, I'm sure you have to get to bed, <laughs> and we have to move on with our bed, <laughs> our day. Okay. Thanks actually, for actually, it. actually, if you guys have two minutes, I actually have something, something to show. I, I mean, I, I've already moved, moved them out. I might as well give, give me a minute, and then I'll, I'll show you this, and then we can all sure. get on. Uh, these are things that I collect in my library. I mean, if you guys would like to see, um, Milana, this is right up your alley. This is all in Russian. <laughs> this is the first or more of the earliest edition of the Mayaskovsky Sonata. Oh, Mayakovsky wrote nice sonatas. Mayakovsky was a good friend of uh, uh, Prokofiev. Anyway, just to show you the first edition, and then I show you something really beautiful. This is the Tchaikovsky Symphony Number no. Six, but rewritten for piano four hands by Tchaikovsky himself. And this is the first edition. I've actually played this at, at a concert as well. This, this <laughs> four hands. And, um, we're speaking about, oh, there you are. Uh, the Argentinian composer, Ginestera. Ginestera, Ginestera. Uh, if you speak Spanish, Ginestera, but he actually preferred to be called Ginestera. This is his 12, oh, I've got light reflection here, 12 Preludes Americanos. Mm -hmm. And hold on. This is the actual, his actual handwriting. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. This is the handwritten mm -hmm. manuscript. Yeah. Uh, speaking of French music, this is really fun. I mean, if uh, if you're a fellow collector, uh, this is not seen now. It's not reproduced in modern editions. But back then, during the days of Debussy and Ravel, the publisher required each composer to have a little logo of his own. 
Yeah. So for example, uh, let's have Ravel since I've got, since I've got Ravel here. So Mar Ravel's name is Maurice Ravel, M R. So this is the first edition uh, Ravel, and it will have this M R. Huh. This is not reproduced now. I I don't know why. And this is uh, Gabriel Fauré. So G F. Hmm. You see that. And then of course Debussy will be Claude Debussy. C D. Mm -hmm. We have that as well. You can see that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. Anyway, well, I've got Messian here. If you want to see Messian, Olivier Messian. This is really cool. This is a cool logo. You can see that. It was his name. Olivier Messia. Oh. So um, I got a Spanish here. One last, one last um, show off piece. <laughs> this is uh, this is a this is a set of uh, a set of short pieces written by Federico Mompo. I highly recommend the music of Mompo. is spiritual. So Bach is the spiritual composer of the 18th century. Mompo is a spiritual composer of the 20th century uh, from Barcelona, very close to where I used to live. And this set of pieces is inspired by uh, a poem and painting. These are actual lithographs. Oh. And then from, from, the, from the lithograph, he would write a piece of music and, and a poem. And then he would write this. Oh, blues. <laughs> Temple of Blues. Oh. So each piece of music is just about a minute long. And for some of you who do actually play, play a bit of piano, you can do it. It's not difficult. And you will have, an, you'll be mesmerized by the music. Mambo. So. Anyway. Thank you, Ernest. Thank you so much. We'll have to have a class on all the, <laughs> all the unknown composers. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I thank you so much, Milana, and I and I wish that um and I wish that all of you, you know, wherever you are, North Carolina, Florida, uh, would would take the time to to listen to different kinds of music, and and through different composers, different music, uh, enjoy different experiences, and perhaps these experiences will give you fresh insights in in real life, in living your real life as well. And, and not just uh, being sort of uh, buried in the same music, the same way of living, in the same thinking, in the same hat. So I, I think art and music does make a difference in a person's life. Absolutely. And uh, thanks for a very inspiring conversation. I think we all went yeah, away with uh, a lot of wonderful ideas. So thank you, Ernest, and thank you everybody for tuning in. And next Wednesday, keep in mind, uh, Eugenia Zuckerman is pretty much all packed already. So if you plan to attend Eugenia Zuckerman's event, make sure you RSVP as soon as possible because that event is going to be completely sold out. Well. Registered, RSVP. <laughs> so uh, I I'm looking forward to seeing you all next uh, Wednesday if you plan to join. And Ernest, I hope we'll see each other more often than than before. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You so much. And have a good night. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye bye. It's good to see all of you.